in keeping with the brain candy theme, I brought some chocolate with me. Who doesn't like, who doesn't like chocolate? But now, all of us have been faced with this dilemma. Do we leave that candy there, that chocolate there, and assume it's dirty? Or do we claim the five second rule and pick it up as quickly as possible, assuming that microbes have not had a chance to get on that candy bar and get a free trip to our mouth? Well, I'll be honest with you, probably most of us have actually eaten food off the floor, including yours truly. But is it safe? Well, in the book, Did You Just Eat That?, the authors explain that microbes do not abide by the five second rule. In fact, uh, salmonella, you know that nasty bacterium that makes about 1.3 million Americans sick each year, gets on bologna and bread in seconds. But you also know that carpet transferred less bacteria to salmonella to the bologna than bread than did tile. Well, before you start eating all your food or dinners off carpet, actually, uh, it still resides there a lot longer. In fact, salmonella lasted up to four weeks on those surfaces. Bottom line is, if you drop food on the floor and there's bacteria or viruses there, they're going to get on your food. So eating food off the floor is a little bit like driving around in a car without a seat belt. You may be able to drive around your whole life, never have an accident, and not get hurt. But if you do have an accident, if there are germs on the floor, your chances of getting sick are pretty high. Well, while we're talking about different ways to get sick, uh, I like to talk about five other everyday habits or behaviors that can transfer disease and germs from person to person. Now, until about six months ago, these were kind of urban, urban myths and kind of fun discussions. But now with the COVID-19 uh, virus going around, they're much more serious. So let's look at our second uh, topic, second behavior. Restaurant menus, deli menus. Do you think it's safe to eat out? Actually, even before the pandemic, the CDC reported that 63% of all food board outbreaks were linked to restaurants and delis. Now, that doesn't mean that the menus were the cause of that, but the fact of the matter is, you think about it, everyone that goes into a restaurant probably contacts and comes in contact with the menu. And in fact, uh, we did a study in our lab and found that there were 6, 000, between 6,000 and 12,000 bacteria in menus we sampled around this local area. Now, that's not unique to this area because they also, in Texas, found staph and E. coli on menus in their restaurants. So one thing to think about, you may want to wash your hands after you order your meal next time you eat out. Third food habit, blowing out birthday candles. Okay, well, as I used to, growing up, used to say, say it, don't spray it. The fact of the matter is everybody's spraying it. Just by breathing, you're releasing 600 to 7,000 bacteria uh, to, the, to the environment. Now, you can't think, how does that happen, you think? Well, we all know now we're wearing masks. That these, that these aerosol bacteria and viruses are tiny water droplets that about 100 times as large as a viral particle. So you can imagine that little water droplets like a bus to those viral particles. And we know now that they can land on surfaces, they can land on other people, so we wear masks. But we also did, a, did a, in our lab, went, tested this out by blowing birthday candles out and found that between 600 and 7,000 bacteria were deposited on the top of birthday cakes when someone blew candles out. Uh, we also know that now, again, this is not news, that COVID and other diseases are spread the way, including tuberculosis, Legionnaire's disease, common cold, uh, whooping cough. So there's a lot of different diseases can be spread from that. These, uh, so think of this scenario. Uh, grandpa, 80-year-old grandpa is blowing his birthday, candle, uh, birthday cake out, 80 candles on it, takes him three or four attempts, and now we're gonna serve that cake, and each attempt he's spraying bacteria on top of that cake, or viruses particles, and now we're gonna serve that cake to his uh, elderly relatives or his grandchildren. This is one uh, tradition we may wanna rethink, depending on who's doing the blowing and who's doing the eating. Okay, beer pong. Uh, that uh, drinking game that was uh, invented in the 1950s up in the Ivy League fraternities. Uh, so, you know, the, the, if those of you have been under a rock, living under a rock for the last 70 years, beer pong, the general principle is two opponents on end of each end of a table have a cup of beer in front of them. The objective is to throw the ping pong ball in the cup of beer. Successful throw means you've got to drink that cup of beer and fill it up again. 
Well, so what's going into that beer besides the ping pong ball? Well, again, we went to, the, went to the lab, actually went out on a Clemson homecoming weekend and collected ping pong balls that were being used in beer pong games. Brought them back to the lab, found out that the average ping pong ball had 200,000 bacteria on it, and a couple, some had up to 3 million bacteria on them. And in addition to that, we found that some of those bacteria were the type that could make you sick, or pathogens. If, you don't, if that doesn't convince you, actually back in 2009, Rensselaer Polytech Institute in upstate New York actually banned beer pong because at that time, from 2009, they, health officials believed it was increasing the spread of bird flu, which killed about 70,000 uh, Americans. So another further information is there's actually national championships of beer pong, believe it or not. And uh, there's been the contestants complained of something known as Pong flu at these, these weekend or these several day championships. So uh, think about that again, a uh, scenario where you're playing beer pong, you're pretty good at it, and your opponent's having to drink a lot. Well, what happens when you drink a lot of beer? You got to go to the laboratory. Uh, being in an inebriated state, party mindset, they pay less attention to personal hygiene than you'd like them to. They come back to the table, get lucky, and throw a ping pong ball in your beer, their hand having been who knows where, and not been washed. So you may want to rethink playing that game as well. Uh, our fifth uh, food habit, uh, sharing popcorn. Popcorn's been around about 4,000 years. Uh, been popular in movie theaters since the 1950s. Uh, speaking of movie theaters, uh, ABC 2020 News Show did a documentary or study and found that fecal bacteria were on movie seats and movie armrests. And another study of a thousand public places in the United States found that one in five had what they called a biochemical marker, which means blood, mucus, or urine. So again, and these are places you touch and then eat popcorn. So what happens when you stick your hand in a bag of popcorn? Again, we went to the lab and found that 79% of the time, you're leaving bacteria behind in that bag or bowl of popcorn. So uh, psychologists tell us that sharing food is a sign of friendship, even intimacy. Uh, but you may want to think about the next time you share a bag or a bowl of popcorn, uh, who your friends are. Uh, better yet, get, maybe get your own bag of popcorn. Okay, our sixth and my last, uh, our last uh, food habit is double dipping. And for those of you who are Seinfeld fans, you can't forget that famous or infamous scene where George and Timmy get in a big argument, almost a physical argument, where George is double dipping at the buffet table and Timmy says, that's just like putting your whole mouth in the dip. Well, it turns out that Timmy was pretty close to being right. We went to the lab and found out again that each time you double dip, you're leaving about 150 to 1,000 oral bacteria in the dip. And again, you can imagine at a party, I mean, Super Bowl party, where you got multiple people going to the dip, if they're all double dipping, that dip may soon become like a bacterial soup. Uh, and we actually sampled it two hours later and found there was still plenty of oral bacteria there. The salsa acidity did not kill the bacteria. Uh, one interesting thing we found out, kind of a side note, is that salsa was worse than chocolate or cheese dip. And that's because the salsa is a little thinner, so more of the contaminated dip goes back into the common bowl. OK, so what do we know? Uh, we know at least these six everyday habits or traditions or whatever you want to call them will transfer disease from person to person. Uh, we also know, the, it's nice to note, that most 99% of bacteria and viruses are harm, harmless, harmless. And actually, some are actually helpful for, for our health, for we eat probiotics, which are very popular now. On the other hand, we also know that, thanks to Louis Pasteur's germ theory, that there are some that can make us very sick. So, my advice and take home message is if you want to be up to have optimal health and minimize your chance of getting sick, don't be the person that someone else asks, did you just eat that? 